I've got a question for you all. Who of you would like to live to be 120 and be happy and healthy along the way? This is a conversation that Sumed and I are having around uh, lifespan versus health span and specifically more than just the science which I geek out on, how we can make it practical and achievable for each and every one of you through our human edge proprietary system of biohacking. So connect with me, Dr. Marcus Rani, your champion of well-being, an individual obsessed by mitochondria and longevity as I have this wonderful conversation with Sumed today on the show. You're a natural. You're an absolute natural at this. Well, you heard the man. Do I need to even say anything more? Dr. Marcus Rane was an absolute pleasure to host on the Sumit Bilgi podcast. What an absolute champion. He's an academic champion and now also um, a scientist, an entrepreneur, uh, a writer, a man who wears many hats, but um, he's a master at so many of them. One of the most intelligent people that I've spoken to on this podcast, and in fact, in my entire life. Um, a short podcast, of course, but every minute of it keeps you at the edge of your seat because there's so much information and so much uh, value for all of us um, via his words and via the work that he's done in the area of well-being and longevity science. Um Dr. Marcus, to give you a brief overview, of course, is the founder of Human Edge, which is a company that's looking to optimize health span and help people live longer through the power of biology, through the power of biohacking and looking into our systems, um, looking inward to try and make this machine work in the best possible way. Um, he's somebody who comes from an absolutely incredible background. I have to open LinkedIn to uh, ensure that I do not miss out on any of his uh, accomplishments of course um you know bachelors of science and then mbbs uh and medicine and surgery from ucl goes on to then work at hang on a minute let me pull this up because i do not want to miss any of it uh doctor at the nhs did an internship at nasa um again at the ucl where he where he studied extreme physiology which is um studying you know, human beings in difficult and adverse conditions, uh, global health commentator for Forbes, a uh, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. It just keeps going on. Uh, and then now, of course, uh, the co-founder of Meds for More and uh, the founder and CEO of Human Edge, as we spoke. Catch your breath, Sumed. A lot of this conversation revolves around aging. It revolves around um, optimization of health. Uh, which comes before prevention of disease, uh, how we can stop diseases before they manifest, or rather how we can you know, do our best to prevent the manifestation of diseases that we're troubled by in our, in our lives, and how the suffering of um, our health can be minimized and can be pushed towards the very end um, to ensure that our passage from the physical plane is as smooth and painless as possible. So a valuable, valuable conversation, not just for people that are looking to live long, but also for people that are, you know, incredibly interested in understanding where technology is taking biology uh, in the future, or rather how the two are working hand in hand to ensure that the human species lives optimized and lives well so i'm going to stop talking right now and roll the episode because this is 45 minutes of absolute pure kick-ass value that you will not get um elsewhere in this space so make sure you hit the subscribe button uh you like this uh this video and share it with as many people as possible because transformation is in your hands you can make it happen there you go. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. Thank you so much. I've been very excited for this chat. Uh, we've, I've been looking forward to it for a very, very long time. Uh, to be very honest, um, you know, a lot of people know me as as the cricket person, but um, health and life and and optimizing, you know, our life is is some is a place where I nerd out a lot. Um, and uh, in the process of putting this podcast together and uh, you know I did come across your work on Instagram and, and then I happened to read up about you and, and listen to you and watch you uh, you know on the internet and I was truly truly taken by 
um, the area that you're working in and you know trying to optimize uh, for the world actually so you know it's it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast dr marcus thank you so much for coming my pleasure thanks for having me superb luck uh, in looking forward to diving in same likewise likewise let's get straight into this um i mean i think it, a great place for us to start uh, would be to just give everybody um a quick background you know a quick uh, a run through about what is it that you've done and what is it that you're um building with the human edge and everything beyond that as well so the stage is yours please go ahead and tell us um this incredible world of of um you know longevity and and research in this um you know ever evolving space all right um let me see how i can make this concise and interesting i am a i'm a student <laughs> of biology i have been fascinated by the human body since i was a young young boy i've got memories growing up in england uh, long afternoons in the library just taking out all the medical and science textbooks that i could find and just consuming and reading as much as i could uh, so i'm very proudly a biology geek and i say that with right. a great pride um my career has allowed me to use that passion uh to experience a whole different set of aspects uh which um i keep finding the dots getting connected more and more as i progress on that journey through life as well um my first phase of my career was very sort of research and uh academic focus i did a, mm -hmm. a degree in in physiology focusing on uh extreme physiology this is what happens to your body when you push it mm -hmm. in extreme environments um right. and at the time i was uh serving in the royal air force in england and this sort of sowed that seed which is that your our body this frame that we have is not fragile it's anti fragile you can mm -hmm. you can push it it won't break uh you can you can train it and it'll excel um mm -hmm. and and that led me to do some fascinating expeditions to mount everest uh to the arctic um i was then invited to work at nasa at kennedy space center as yeah. part of one of the shuttle missions i was on the ground unfortunately but looking after <laughs> uh the space crew that was going up uh to the international space station and a whole bunch of other experiences through my through my career which have just uh reinforced this idea that you push your body it learns from it it adapts to it it excels at it and then you become the stronger version um the second part of my career was more traditional medicine uh, as a mm -hmm. as a as a clinician i uh, my second degree was in, in medicine i trained at university college in london uh and then worked as a doctor mm -hmm. in the nhs uh but for me i discovered that the healthcare systems around the world are disease focused pathogenic mm -hmm. it's sick care as the paradigm it's not mm -hmm. really healthcare which is important mm -hmm. it needs to be solved for but because of my passion around optimization i just found myself a little bit of a misfit uh in that uh in that paradigm so that led me to my next phase which is um i i moved to india this is about 12 years ago now i met a girl i followed her here best decision of my life uh <laughs> and uh when i when i when i came to this country uh i worked as a management consultant and then i was part of the founding team for a venture fund uh all the time looking at new technologies uh which are integrating themselves in the health wellness and sick care ecosystem uh continually getting exposed to newer and newer ideas uh and uh, things and then mm -hmm. finally uh about 2 years ago after a lot of life events that happened through covid uh the world really all of us got impacted and affected in different ways I I took a little bit of a sabbatical I went back to frontline medicine as a volunteer working in Mumbai uh for yeah. the BMC um I unfortunately fell ill with the viral strain the first time around with the original strain was mm -hmm. very sick and had to go through this process of rehabilitation and recovery myself and that started to question a lot of things in my life about what I wanted to do what I wanted to achieve what is the legacy that I want to leave behind and what do i really enjoy doing which is this going back to the same principles around biology mm. and optimization and mm. human edge was born and so that was the journey over two two and a half uh, decades that finally led me to uh, to launching human edge so longevity scientist very interesting i think um, you know in build up to us speaking today 
I I yeah. obviously had a chat with a lot of people um that are obviously a part of the company etc and everybody's quite enamored by it. Um Dr David Sinclair doc you know Peter Ritty are two people that I've been following over the internet mm. as well for a while. Yeah. Um so you know the 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 field was not new to me or the area of research was not new to me but I think uh, for people to just understand where and uh, how this space has come about now and where it's going could you lay the foundation for that for our chat because yeah. um I've heard you say that the uh, uh, that the next coming or, or in the next few decades and definitely the 22nd century is a lot about biology and trying to live longer and how we can optimize our yeah. lives and our existence yeah. so i think it would be great if you could lay the foundation for that where yeah, are we absolutely. where are we going i think um, you know firstly if we look at the waves of human technology and development uh, we mm. have just come out of sort of the 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 the, the it driven wave of human advancement which is yeah. really the integration of different types of technologies mobile communications etc uh to connect us as a planet as a species uh and yeah. now to augment and fuel us to the next layer beyond that i think the next frontier really exists around biology about unlocking the power within ourselves and externally as well biology is not just focused on human beings but biology from uh the ecosystems around us whether that's nature and green technology whether it's new food systems which we need to solve for whether that's um uh whether that's different methodologies of allowing our species to travel intergalactically uh within yeah. planetary systems etc so there's lots and lots of aspects that biology will now be that frontier which has to be unlocked for for our species to take it to the next level i think when we look at uh our paradigm of health over the last few decades now we started off as um uh, i suppose at the back of the second world war where infectious diseases was the big thing to be solved for and sort of advancements in antibiotics and, and sterilization techniques etc yeah. new surgical techniques etc helped us there uh, then we entered the phase of non communicable diseases which is where we are very much today and uh, we're looking at lifestyles and metab- metabolism uh, uh, and preventive forms of health so we've gone from sick and disease to prevention mm-hmm. forms of health and what i'm proposing as an idea is that we look future forward now which is mm-hmm. that we move beyond prevention and we work towards optimization so we go from curation mm-hmm. to cure from cure to prevention and from prevention now to optimization and this is i think that next layer and what we as human age as a company operating in the space are trying to be part of that early uh, leadership around and i think the third key idea around this trend is that for all to long the obsession with our species was on this numerical number of life span and and we've done hugely well in india just since independence we've gone i think from a life expectancy of uh, early 40s to today i think we're at 69 72 for women right Correct. so yeah. we made massive advancements of the last two decades mainly around infectious disease and now non communicable correct etc and we need to now push that uh, yeah. but uh for us now as you speak about peter and david and many others like neil bazalai and matt cablein uh hugely yeah. influential people out there who many of whom we're very fortunate to have on our advisory board as well um Wonderful. it's about it's about health span so now we move the conversation yeah. from life span as a number to health span as a concept which is how do you add the health into your years how do you live as healthy for as long as possible how do you push mm. that first life event of the onset of a form of chronic disease which is becoming yeah. younger and younger now and now reverse that in the other direction so that happens at a much later stage because if aging is a collection of diseases and aging itself could very much be a central disease which manifests itself as various other types of diseases then how do we prevent or delay the onset of aging as a disease and extend mm. that health span coefficient for as long as possible yeah a few things that you said there i think i'm going to sort of uh, pick one after the other to just yeah. ensure that our audiences um understand that i think i'd like to start off by first making a clear differentiation between health span and life span because um yeah. it it seems like they're interlinked aren't they 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 do uh, they are two different concepts they're two different thoughts but somehow they they are not two parallel lines they intersect at some point right so um how do you look at this conversation health span versus life span and where do you sit on that sort of debate and conversation 
No, you're absolutely right. They are interlinked. And I think, you know, if, if I had a board behind me, one could draw on the x-axis the number of years and on the y-axis your quality of health score. Right? How healthy are you on a scale of relativity? And you can imagine that when you're born, you start somewhere near 100% for most people. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the first two, three, four decades, you're sort of at a, at a in fact, you probably go up a little bit as a plateau effect. And then you, you start coming down that other the, the other end of the curve. Now, what our goal, uh, so that's lifespan, right? And when that line hits the x-axis, uh, that's the number of years and that's your lifespan number, right? Your life expectancy number. Our goal of health span is to do two things to that curve. One is to shift that curve along the x-axis further out. So your overall number of years potentially increases. So you're increasing your number of years. Mm. But at the same time, you are pulling that curve. You can imagine an elastic band on the, on the curve function of that. And you're yeah. pulling it out further so that the amount of time you spend in health state as close to 100 is, is, is extended as much as possible. And then you very quickly crash at the other end. You want to ensure mm. that that differential line is as near one as possible so that when you are sick, it happens for a very, very small period of time right at the end of your life. So that mm -hmm. suffering and disease is minimized as much as possible. So that's when the interrelation, interrelatedness between health span and, and lifespan becomes so important. Not just increasing number of years, but ensuring that curve drop off is as quickly as possible. Because we all will die, right? There's no getting around that fact. <laughs> and I don't think any of us in the industry are under the illusion that we will live forever. I don't think anyone wants to live forever, quite frankly. Okay. Uh, but if we are to die, how can we ensure that those years spent in your marginal decade, which is that last decade of life, are as comfortable, disease-free, and as optimal as possible? Got it. I'm going to come to tools a little later. Obviously, you know, now that you talk about extending the axis, the tools obviously become very important, but we'll come to that a little later. Um, yeah. There are two hypotheses that I want to sort of demystify for a few people that we uh, that we'll for the sake of our discourse, assume today. And, and of course, um, through your research, you are obviously giving a lot of, um, you know, substance to it. One is, of course, that aging can be controlled. This is this is a conversation that's happening a lot. Um, how do you look at that? Would, would you like to introduce that hypothesis to people now? Um, and then we'll build on our conversation further. Yeah. So we often have always been taught this idea that aging is a natural consequence of life, right? If you, yeah. and uh, one of our mentors and, and board members, Nir Barzilai, gives this fantastic example of when he was a young medical student sitting out in, in a big lecture theater and you can look around the room and as mm. you're surrounded by all those people, you may not know which individual is hypertensive, diabetic, PCOS, uh, uh, cancer survivor, etc. We don't, we can't see that immediately and know that. <laughs> but as you look around the room, you'll, get, you'll be able to put a decade on everyone's life. You know that this person is probably 20 to 30. This person is likely 50 to 60. This person might be 80 plus, etc. So there is mm. some quality which exists in our, in our biological existence, which gives us an indication that we are quote unquote aging, right? right. Something is beginning. There's a decline that's happening. There's a frailty which is occurring, etc. These are phenotypic yeah. changes. These are physical characteristics which are changing. Uh, that there are visible to the naked eye of the other person. Hmm. Going underneath the skin, going at a cellular level, there have now been recognized that there are nine hallmarks of aging, right? These are things like telomere uh, reduction, so the reduction of the caps at the end of your chromosomes. This is hmm. mitochondrial dysfunction. This is dysregulation of protein synthesis. Uh, hmm. This is um, aggregation of protein clumps. Um, uh, alterations in cell signaling pathways, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, right? There are nine right. and they're well documented and uh, your, your audience can check them out as well. So we're yeah. now connecting the physical attributes to what's happening at the cellular level as well. So there's aging, which is happening mm -hmm. at a cellular level, which is then leading to this. But that aging, which happens at a cellular level is not something which necessarily needs to happen uh, in a sequential way. It's not something that has to progress at a uniform pace throughout our lives. There is a degree of control or external force that can be applied to that rules of biological aging, which can act to slow it down. And in some instances, if you listen to David Sinclair's work around the analogy that he uses of the recorder, 
that you could yeah. reset it, that yes. you could actually reset it and take it to a primordial stage and then go back in time and then uh, and then create some degree of longevity from that perspective. Now, that's a theory yet to be yes. proven out. And a lot of his work of around Stuart, Search 1 and Search <laughs> 2 looks at that. But this is what we find very interesting, is that aging may be occurring, but the pace of aging is something which is under control. And if mm. we understand the, the factors that drive that pace of change, we can quote unquote, control that rate of change and use it to our advantage. Now, how do you measure it is something which there is a great degree of debate around. Some people mm. have been proponents of the quote unquote biological clock. And for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you would have seen that my wife and I, we did this recently where there are tests available in various labs around the world that you can provide a saliva sample and they mm. look at the epigenetic makeup of your DNA, i.e. the manifestation of certain genes, and particularly mm. the number of genes that have got methyl groups, that's a carbon with three hydrogens attached right. to it. And there are various internationally published calculators now, the Hovath clock is the most popular one, which, mm. which, which extrapolates and quantifies the number of methyl groups as a correlation with quote unquote how biologically old you are i.e if you mm. have a lot of a lot of methyl groups you're older if you've got less methyl groups you're younger so that's one form of biological calculation right it's different from your chronological age so as an example i took the test on my 39th birthday but the biological clock gave me an age, I think I was 59, uh, 35.9 years old, right? So biologically, right. I am younger than my chronological age. And the reason I got so excited because I beat my wife, who's younger to me chronologically, <laughs> but, but biologically, I'm, I'm younger to her. So this could be one mechanism to mm. identify the age of an individual biologically. And then as we get to the treatment side later on through the biohacking layer, which we talk a lot about, then, then nudge that person younger and younger. Another way to look at it is purely from a, uh, a phenotypic change. So there are some interesting experiments and uh, there's one happening at the National University in Singapore where they are looking at camera, phone camera-based imaging that you take a photograph of your face and mm -hmm. it runs an algorithm looking at all the lines and the freckles and the various things that are not visible to the naked eye but an uh, uh, artificial intelligence slash machine learning algorithm can, can calculate the rate at which you are aging from the skin changes externally manifesting on your face. Then because there are that is the easiest determinant of aging, right? That's the first I, thing I, that I, you know. That yeah, you I, I, won't use the, you, I, I don't want to use the word easiest. It is something which right, of is course. Yeah. apparent. Uh, apparent, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Exactly. It's, it's externally apparent and it's something which is very intuitive to us, right? So that's mm -hmm. there. Then there are other organizations. So we currently work with a, a, a small group of researchers at IIT, Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai. And we are looking at blood-based analyses, predictive analyses of how old you are. So from your blood samples, if we can measure your fasting insulin, your triglycerides, your liver enzymes, your HbA1c, your, your blood glucose levels, etc. Can we extrapolate from that? How healthy is your metabolism? How much gain is there in your inflammatory cascade in your body? How mm. optimized is your mitochondria, energetics, etc. Right? Mm. So lots and lots of new techniques and new measurements which can also happen. So it's an exciting space. But the goal is, I mean, the understanding really is that aging is a process like any process, it has a rate of change, and that rate of change can potentially be slowed down through specific interventions which need to be measured over a period of time. So that's the big idea. Mm, interesting. I think this is a good time to introduce uh, mitochondrial optimization. It's a word that you've used. It's a word that um, you've used in um, you know, your presence on social as well. Uh, that's an area that you're looking yeah. into very strongly. Um, since we spoke about about cells, 
obviously mitochondria is is vital and key because it's responsible for energy production and and everything i mean i i'm i'm a beginner to this um i never really understood biology in school somehow in my late 20s i've become incredibly enamored by the body but um, i want to leave this to you and and share with us what do you mean by mitochondrial optimization and um how does going down to the cellular level um you know sort of uh tie in and and how important it is to to work you know in this area of optimizing our health span yeah in um let me take you back in time in 2005 when i was completing my uh, degree in physiology i was exposed to this idea as i was talking to you about about extreme physiology and mm. i was being given a lecture by a high a professor of intensive care his name is professor hugh montgomery a great great mentor of mine now and he was talking about how he takes care of very very sick patients in the icu daily and one of the massive paradoxes which existed at the time which is if you give them too much oxygen they actually get sicker right mm. and this was a big paradox because we think that oxygen is critical to survival so the more oxygen you give someone surely the better it is for them and here very there was a group of patients who were doing yeah. worse off with high oxygen and as that clinical question started to manifest itself amongst this group of intensivists they decided that the only natural environment around the world which replicates a low oxygen environment that you can take a large group of healthy people to was the summit of mount everest mm. uh, and this is where the everest expedition began and and that was really a story 2 3 years which played out i got to spend over a month on the mountain i led a large team to base camp we were over wow. 60 doctors 100 people in total we were doing all kinds of different experiments on ourselves and the central question was about what is the role of oxygen in cellular metabolism and energy and fundamentally at the core was this tiny little organelle that we may have read about in our biology textbooks which was mitochondria so i was mm. hooked i was obsessed a few years later on halloween as i was thinking what should i dress up as i decided to create my own superhero and i named him captain mitochondria and uh, i had a i had a cape of invincibility i had a mask of efficiency i had a belt of uh, electron transport all kinds of very geeky i told you i was a geek right so no but i hope uh, comic book writers are listening this is a great idea steal it <laughs> oh well, well, well okay well yes please please let's let's maybe we should have copyrighted it before royalties so yes royalties <laughs> but it, it 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 even made its way into my book at the human edge so much so that i dedicated the last chapter to the future frontier of medicine which is mitochondria right mm. so the reason why mitochondria is so important is it's not just from an energy perspective and and readers of my book will see it appear across the chapter of summiting everest completing a marathon to going into space to diving in the sahara in the uh, mariana trench etc it's not just critical from an energy perspective for a day to day demands but as the mitochondrial efficiency of their cell lines begin to diminish whether it's the beta cell of your pancreas that beta cell can now no longer create energy that means it can no longer do its job which is the excretion of insulin if it's the beta cell uh, sorry if it's the cardiac myocyte the mitochondria in the cardiac myocyte can no longer perform its job which is the contractility of the heart as a pump if it's mm. the uh, if it's a if it's a neuronal cell in your brain and the inability to communicate or or excrete a particular neurochemical transmitter etc we are now seeing in the disease world that the onset of mitochondrial dysregulation and inefficiency as being one of the starting points for the explosion of disease states as we get later and later mm. through life so the reason why we are so excited and interested as a company and as why i'm so excited about the mitochondria is if we can help optimize mitochondria through lifestyle interventions then we can not only enhance your energy levels on a day to day basis but over a period of time we can hopefully delay the onset of chronic disease and start to improve the coefficient of health span which is what we've been talking about since the beginning of this episode mm. 
all right i think i'd like to shift gears uh, from going up from going now upwards from a cellular level to the macro picture as we move towards the end of this episode yeah. um one of the things that you've been speaking a lot as well is that we your, your estimate is we can live till 120 is that accurate is is that what you're saying broadly i think that's the yeah broadly. i mean that's broadly the consensus actually all I right think, so uh, uh, so, just just for us to sort of optimize this section, because I really want this to be, um, you know, really accurate. Give us the starter pack to live till 120. <laughs> what is it? What do we need to do to live till 120, according to you? Right. So, you know, a lot of people ask, is it the nature versus nurture debate? And let's just hit that mm -hmm. on the head straight away by saying that uh, nature, your genes have an important role to play. Yes. But specifically at the population level, it's the environment, it's the nurturing effect which have the most role to play when it comes to the longevity perspective. Roughly mm -hmm. speaking, that's an 80-20 rule. So 80% of it comes down to nurture environment choices and decisions, and 20% is your genes and the DNA. Epigenome versus it. genome, right? Uh, well, yeah. So uh, epigenome is the expression of certain disease, uh, genes, and that expression is influenced by your environment. But the exactly. hard coding of your genes only roughly play a, a 15 to 20% role. Now, if you're unfortunate to have a BRCA2 gene, uh, which, uh, which uh, gives you a higher probability of breast cancer, or if mm -hmm. you're unfortunate to have a, a gene carried to APOE, which gives you a higher probability of having dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Then, so that's part of that 15, 20%. But for all the other spectrum people, which is whether it's metabolic syndrome, non-communicable diseases, et cetera, et cetera, it's the environment which influences you major, right? So that's the first thumb rule. Look at your environment, right? So if we, if we consider then the things around us, then there are five key pillars, which are the things, you know, folks will often have heard me talk about. The first one is sleep. The second one is how you fuel the body. The third is the amount of movement and exercise that we get. The fourth is the physical environment. And when I say environment, I mean three things, people, places, and technologies. So the people that you surround yourself with, the places that you're immersed in and the technologies that you have access to, that comes in environment pillar. And the fifth pillar is your emotional state and right? your mood and emotion, which also mm -hmm. if uh, for today being World Mental Health Day that it we're is. doing this recording on the yeah. 10th of October, um, yeah. you know, the newsletter that I sent out to my readership was all about the interrelationship between mental health and longevity. Right. Yes. Because we forget that that's really a big, important part. So that's the that's the second piece of this puzzle. So the first piece of the puzzle is that the genetics is a small component. The environment is the bigger component. And then within the environment, these are the five pillars, sleep, movement, fueling, environment, physical environment and, and mood and emotion. And then as we break those down, that's where we get to the interventions and the prescriptions, which for me as a doctor, it's not a prescription of drugs. It's a prescription of lifestyle interventions that I can tell you when to do, what to do, how much to do it, how many days to do it for, track it over a period of time, and then level you up and switch you up to then start the next biohack and the next biohack. So that's sort of the intervention mm. protocol for this. Yeah. At the start of our conversation, we did obviously mention that we'll come to the tools uh, a little later uh, with regards to yeah. in, in optimizing it. So uh, do do these five vectors fall under you know your major tools that you're going to be working with? Um, or Absolutely. that you work yeah. with. Yeah, they're the five vectors that uh, make change. The transaction uh, is what we call the biohack. Uh, Human Edge is a biohacking company. Uh, we have built a over the last few years a massive library of biohacks, which are prescriptively available to individual based on their health objective and outcome, based on their biomarker of interest, etc. And the premise is that in the same way that as a clinician, I might prescribe a drug. So let's say an individual with type two, I don't like type two, let's uh, as an example, non-insulin yeah. dependent diabetes is sitting in front yeah. of me. Yeah. Yeah. Then instead of prescribing metformin 1500 milligrams twice a day, 8 a.m., 8 p.m. for six weeks and then come back mm. and review, now I will prescribe a biohack to be done at a particular time for a particular frequency at a particular dosage uh, with the science. And then we review that uh, with a specific biomarker of interest, right? That's when it starts to become applicable and comfortable for people to start making these changes in their lives. Extraordinary. Wow. I think uh, we're, we're quite, um, we're touching upon some 
it, it feels like the future doesn't it i mean if for for anybody else that's just listening and watching this that isn't really reading into it that isn't um you know diving into it as as deep as you are i'm i'm literally just splashing around the water just just trying to absorb things all of this seems like um if very futuristic but in, in you know are we here is this is this has this arrived um you know have we arrived in the sense is is there a full fledged industry that is booming that is growing around optimizing lifespan around health span and how can people begin their journey uh in trying to absorb all of this and and try to optimize you know their lifespan the there's a lot of ancient wisdom which has existed for <laughs> centuries and generations gone by if we take the one of the most popular cultural changes that have happened in the last year or so have been this massive zeitgeist conversation around the role of intermittent fasting or calorie restricted eating or time restricted eating right but as we in science begin to understand the cellular mechanisms for how these different types of uh interventions work and for whom mm. they should be working for every single cultural spirituality which has existed in our species have had this built in fasting periods of starvation uh, exist in jainism in in christianity in judaism in islam in in Jewish all of these different uh, practices right yeah, and this is just one example there are so many wisdoms that have existed in our species cultures over the last hundreds of thousands of years uh mm. tens of thousands of years and beyond that we now at science are catching up so you're right in saying there's a futuristic element but i just want to remind us all that there is a wisdom that we are slowly beginning to unlock as science catches up with this um you know i if if we look at the market that you spoke about one of the figures that i saw most recently is the global biohacking market was 15 billion dollars last year right so that's a massive number wow. and it contributes to the well-being market which contributes to the health market uh etc cetera, etc cetera. i think the biggest uh area of growth has been around consumable wearables over the last 2 3 years the growth on growth every single year even companies now google acquiring fitbit apple repositioning itself as a health wearable company uh mm-hmm. you know we have massive fmcg companies which are now making a string of acquisitions for healthy supplements um we have big content providers globally which are entering into the health and wellness uh, creation ecosystem so there's just so much that is going on i think covid was the grand realization for society that health and well-being is our number one priority at the mm. individual level at the organization level at the systemic level as well there's no going away from that fact now so yes there's going to be an influx of many many entities and organizations yes there is a ever involved intersecting world of technology and biology coming together and um, we as human edge and myself we're just excited to be surfing that wave and hopefully creating some positive impact and uh, and having some fun through the science along the way paint us a picture where do you see human edge and yourself in uh, i don't know the rate at which technology is moving i i'm i'm you know to, to say where do you see yourself in 10 years was uh, was a very interesting question back in the day a few years ago rather but now yeah. at the rate at which yeah. technology evolves a year or two down the line things might be completely different but what what is your vision for the human edge's future your future and what is that you want to accomplish Yeah. So our five-year vision. You're right. We don't think in ten-year horizons. We think in five-year horizons. Our five-year vision right. is to build a platform which will help you know yourself better and therefore provide those lifestyle interventions to enhance your health span. That's it. Plain and simple mission statement. Love that. Exactly. Unlocking the power of biology. That's what I've been doing for twenty-five years, and that's what I want to continue doing for the next eighty <laughs> years that I eighty-one years that I have left. Hopefully. excellent excellent we have a timeline as well i love that thank you so much i i love this chat thank you so very much for your time i think before before we go two things uh, yeah. firstly where can people find you where can people read your read about your work uh, follow your company yeah. a quick shout out to yourself thank you so i'm very active on social media linkedin is the easiest place to get me uh, my handle is dr marcus 
uh, Rani R A N N E Y Instagram uh, again very very uh, um, engaged on Instagram at hmm. doc d o c m and then my surname R A N N E Y um, our company Human Edge our website is humanedge.co.co uh, and uh, in addition to talking about our mobile app which is going live in the next uh, eight weeks so we'll be very interested in beta testers reaching out and uh, if they want to be part of that early test. Unit absolutely, yep, for sure, Sumit. Uh, you know, reach out to me <laughs> on Insta, on LinkedIn, or through the website. Uh, and then yeah. we're just about to launch a um, uh, a content portal as well, so that all the latest science, uh, decoded, demystified, uh, can be brought to people around the world as well. Yeah, lovely. I love that. Thank you so much.